I gotta tell you guys about a few new products over at our favorite CBD store. That's of course PalomaVerdeCBD.com. The first thing I'm gonna tell you about that's brand new over there is these THCV gummies. There's 10 milligrams of THCV per gummy and 10 gummies per jar. A lot of y'all are probably familiar with this THCV. Some people call it diet weed. It's very good for intermittent fasters. THCV helps suppress or dull your appetite, which of course, a little bit unlike regular THC that as you probably know, or at least you've heard, can give you the munchies. THCV helps promote energy unlike regular THC, which of course makes you feel kind of mellow. This is legal, oh my God, legal under the Farm Bill. So thank you, Farm Bill. The second thing I wanna tell you about that's new over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com is their full spectrum nano CBD soft gels. These have the perfect amount of CBD with THC. 25 milligrams of CBD and 0.27 milligrams of THC per soft gel. Their everyday formula brings your body back to homeostasis and adds this nice extra layer of chill. I like that. I think you do too. A lot of us need that now and again, or maybe every day. Nanotechnology allows better absorption into your body even better than their other products, which was already amazing. Again, this has a calming effect and it lasts about six to eight hours. And of course, like the other stuff, it's legal under what? The Farm Bill. Thank you, Farm Bill. It's legal. I would not get you guys in trouble. Go over to PalomaVerdeCBD.com. They've got a lot of great products. I talk about them all the time. The massage oil. They've got the sleep bundle. They got nano CBD soft gels, CBD bath bombs, which are amazing. Gummies, tinctures, all of that stuff. Of course, for my French bulldog, Lux and George, the pet tinctures and the pet gummies. All of these things are over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Oh yeah, did I tell you about the cool menthol sports cream? Of course I have before. It's the best sports cream in the world. I get reviews from customers on this all the time. That's the number one thing I like from this company. And they've got all of these great things. Over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com, you will get a promo code because Carlos and Vanessa, the owners, love this show and they want to help out the listeners of this show. Promo code BUCK at checkout gets you 20% off of your order over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Promo code BUCK at checkout gets you 20% off of your order. Go give them business and in turn, give me business. Now, let's get back to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call them the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquids, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Thank you for being here with me again this week. So in the podcasting world, we have what we like to call one or two in the bank. And so that's what this episode is. I was swamped this week and could not record one for this week. But if you know what you're doing, and every once in a while I do, you keep one or two good ones that are kind of timeless, if you will, in the bank. And really, I didn't even need to tell you that except... It comes up once, I think, in this episode about the Russia and Ukraine conflict. And well, when I was speaking about it, it was just starting to happen. So I didn't want you guys to go, he sounds like he has no idea what's going on. Basically, that's why I'm telling you that I had this one in the bank and I was swamped this week. So I'm giving you this wonderful interview with Dr. Timothy Patitsas. He's an interim dean of Hellenic College and assistant professor of ethics at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. And he wrote this wonderful, thick, nuanced, and well put together great book called The Ethics of Beauty. And so within this conversation, we're going to talk a lot about the things in this book, naturally, but it kind of takes a what he calls a beauty first approach. And he lays out examples of how you would apply this beauty first. It's almost like therapy, but better, if you will. But we talk about political theory, war, psychology, a lot about trauma, which is uh, some interesting things in there, the gender stuff, all kinds of things. And I think that you will find this really, this is kind of a comforting interview, if you will. It's not going to stress you like some of the topics I talk about so often. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. And I was so glad to get him to do this interview. And I will keep you waiting no longer. 
Dr. Timothy Patitsas, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Fuck, I'm so glad to be here. I'm okay. Good. Yes. Good, yeah. <laughs> you, you got your shoes off and I got my uh, house <laughs> shoes on. So I think, I think we're at least comfortable at this point. Yeah. Um, I brought you on because I've been reading your book, The Ethics of Beauty. And it's, it's uh, really, really good. It's definitely different. And the title is wonderful. Uh, that's initially what got me. Then I started reading the about section and some reviews. And I said, I have to get this. And uh, it's, it's great. I will say part of why I love it is um, for my audience who are watching this, you can see this is not a small book. However, when it's written like it's written, it's really uh, an easier method of, of, of reading. It, it leads to an easier method of reading. And what I mean is it's written in an interview form. And so it kind of keeps me as the reader engaged. I assume you've heard feedback similar to that. That's right. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, I had done interviews with Road to Emmaus magazine before, and I didn't, I, I, I sort of knew what they were about. So I was going to do uh, an, an interview with them about war. And I, I thought, I can just interview myself. I'll just pretend to be Road to Emmaus. So I did that for chapters one and two. And then, then I just figured I'd finish the whole book that way. And it, it was, it's a much easier to write that way too. Because, you know, you don't have to constantly go back and redo the whole chapter around the central conclusion. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't do another book like that. I mean, it was... I, I was on fire for those things. So, <laughs> did you did you speak out the part and then have it and then have someone write it down or or notate it or did you actually write it just like it's like it is? The, the, I think the first two chapters. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember. I just I, I wrote them out and then okay. then I had a, a, a sabbatical from my my teaching job here and chapters three through eight. Yeah, it was just three hours a day of writing, no more. And it, it just came together quickly. Then the editing is where things get in trouble in writing a book. Okay. Things, like in film, we say, we'll fix it in post. Um, yes, the yes. Editors want to fix it in post, and they almost will take away what you said to begin with by the time they're done editing. We'll see. Now my listeners are going to go, aha, that's why at the beginning when Buck said, hey, Chris, cut this part, you immediately go, no, no, keep, keep that in there. Um, yeah, just keep, 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 the, yeah. keep the process. <laughs> so the ethics of beauty, uh, I, I guess when I first read that title, it was, I was intrigued and I, I loved it. And it's not exactly, then I, I got the book where I, I started reading the about and I was like, wow, this is even neater than I thought. This is a little different than I had actually anticipated it initially. So what's your kind of, let's say, elevator pitch if someone says, uh, Timothy, what's the, generally, what is uh, your book, The Ethics of Beauty, about? Yep. People often think it's going to be about, let's say, the cosmetic industry or pressure for... Uh, plastic surgery or something. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, well, I didn't think that, but, it, it, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. I, I think there are, you know, ethical books written about those things. Um, yeah. What's the elevator pitch? You know, there's a book by this title called the old way of seeing. And, um, and, and that's really what it would, it, that book is specifically about architecture, but this book is about an older, old, older and alternative way of seeing the world, which a lot of people are hungry for again, and yes. which makes a lot of sense. It's also a book about trauma, and it's a book um, written to soldiers. And uh, that's a surprise for people to think that you know, a book about beauty really begins with a meditation on war and the uh, spiritual cost, moral cost of, of participating in war. You mentioned, um, you might actually forget this, maybe you won't. It, 
a kind of, maybe it's your general uh, definition of trauma. Do you remember what that is or, or what would you say that is? Generalized definition. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I try to, I try to come up with a couple of, of definitions, but it's an, an encounter with ugliness when that ugliness seems to have a revelatory force. It seems to be disclosing that the world is a bad place. Uh-huh. And this combination of ugliness and badness <laughs> um, seems to be the ultimate truth about the world. So it's um, because bad things happen all the time, but they aren't. Um, they aren't. They, d- they don't normally carry that sense. And, and, then, and then in terms of, let's say, the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, I said trauma is a forced feeding from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, it's bad enough when we do that voluntarily, but being forced to. And then, um, yeah, yeah I, I think those are, those are a couple of ways of looking at it. And another one was the opposite of beauty, which I liked as well. It, 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 yeah, it is. It, trauma is, it's a kick in the head, you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> and the, I found it interesting, and you've kind of alluded to it already, is that you start a book called The Ethics of Beauty with a topic that, like we just mentioned, is kind of the opposite of beauty. And I love the first couple of chapters. Um, I think for one, people in their 30s, let's say, I mean, all they've known is America at war for the most part. Hmm. And now it sounds like a little bit, you know, you never know how these things work, but it sounds like some cheerleaders for war are at it again, if if you watch the mainstream media at this point. Um, Let's jump to that really quick before we get to to trauma and war. Do you have any thoughts on what's going on right now with, with, with what's going on with Russia and Ukraine? You know, I've never been to Ukraine. I've been to Russia before. I, I don't, um, you know, I'm not an area specialist. So I, I, I suppose someone could say, look, look, we had 30 years here since Ukraine you know, became independent to work this out. We had 30 years where the, Ru- the Russians were trying to enforce a kind of Monroe doctrine uh, in their, their near West. And I think if, if, you know, if we remember that, you know, that's one way to look at that. Like we have a Monroe Doctrine. We don't want other countries floating around anywhere in our hemisphere. Um, then, but the other way of looking at this is that we were dealing with someone um, in the Russian leadership who, no matter what we had done, we're going to take that and go further. We seem... Uh, as a as a foreign policy elite to have uh, fallen right in between those two conclusions, we couldn't decide which one it was. So we did enough to provoke them, but not enough to defend uh, the Ukrainians. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. when it happened. So, um, you know when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, Yogi Berra said, and and. Sometimes, and, and it seemed like we just didn't. Now, from here, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you hear different things about what's going to happen next. And um, certainly prayer is a rational response when there's so many unknowns and uncertainties. Uh, things happen behind closed doors. Uh, information is available to the highest echelons of decision makers that will never be made available to us. Um, so prayer in, in a circumstance like that is, is rational, especially with, with so many um, potential dangers in all directions. Right. It's not kind of a terrible answer, isn't it? No. I, no. I, I don't know. I really don't right. know. I, it it, it breaks, breaks my heart, yes. certainly. Well, uh, you, in this book, you cover a litany of issues. And like we said, war is, is the one to start. But you hit social justice and... and and topics that will be familiar with a lot of my audience, gender identity. And with all of this, you focus on a beauty first approach. Can we start here with what is meant by that? Yeah, that's, 
I guess in the elevator pitch, that's what, you know, you know what is the beauty first way? Mm -hmm. And um, the idea here is that there is some kind of training of the eye, um, training of our vision, that some purification of our um, a- apprehending of the world that is a presupposition to thinking clearly. And it, it cannot be, um, it can't, you can't skip a step. And, and, and when we don't skip that step, we find that our rational thinking becomes infused with more wisdom and uh, attracts the grace of God. Um, when we do skip that step, it's usually because out of hubris, you know, we think that we know more than we do, or that, it, it, that we take out of hubris, we take our rationality as a given and then try to deploy it to analyze the world. But it's, not, it's really not a given. It's a gift, and it's a gift that is kind of conditional. Um, yeah. I don't want to say too much more. I don't want to lose the listener. No, no. Um, yeah. Now, now this was, this became known to me in those terms because there was a, a kind of um, a split or a bifurcation in the ancient Christian world by the fourth century. So very early, before any other schism occurred east and west, there was this bifurcation of whether or not we should guard against sensual sins first or against intellectual sins first, like pride. And in a way, it's just a matter of terminology. They're the same. Um, in another way, it makes a huge difference. Um, the, when, we, when we attend to sensuality first and try to cultivate chastity, then our our intellect, our use of our intellectual powers is amplified and they're more certain. Um, when we think that, that the intellectual force is, is it really what it's sufficient that that be purified. If we're smart enough, you know, and, and I think, I think so for me as an academic, right, the whole book is, is a protest against mm. smart people. Mm. Um, Taylor Swift was apparently told by someone, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Mm -hmm. But in the academic world, everyone's trying to be the smartest guy in the room. And, Mm -hmm. and, and in, in our foreign policy world, in our public intellectual world, um, that emphasis on, you know, brain power above all, um, you know, it, it, we have wrecked our agriculture as, as a, in the West. I mean, in, in the United States, and I, I assume Canada, I don't know about other parts of the West. We have wrecked our cities with this truth first brainiac approach. Um, we are $30 trillion in debt with very little to show for that. Um, we have welfare policies that seem to harm the poor as much as help them. Um, the smartest people have had their shot and they have continually brought us to uh, the brink of bankruptcy. Our soil is bankrupt. Our educational system is looking often quite bankrupt. I don't think it's that bad, but in some ways it is bankrupt. And, um, and this older, and, and, and I think this older approach, you know, I don't know if it's right to describe it as more feminine, but it, it, it may be, you know, that it's, it, at any rate, it's more balanced. Um, and balanced with, you know, if one of the sides is what you're saying, the brain, t- excuse me, the brainiac side, what does it need to be balanced with then? The, the way of the body and the way of the heart okay. and, um, and with tradition. And with um, just old people, <laughs> we need old people. 
You, you need, you know, the, the, as Solzhenitsyn said, the, the village graveyard. You, you, you need mm-hmm. some people around who just seen stuff. And, gotcha. um, yeah, tradition. Yeah. You, you could put this in military terms. You know, young okay. officers told often, lean on your non-cons. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't go to college. She didn't go to college. Um, I guess it's mostly he, you know, still today, but he didn't go to college. And uh, maybe you outscore him on the IQ test. Maybe you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have been living among the enlisted people for 5, 10, 15 years or more. They've seen it all. They've seen great ideas come and go. And um, where, where is that? Who makes that argument in the academy? Lead on mm-hmm. your non-cops. No one. Um, The analogy for that in a family is, you know, a a dad who's smart enough to listen to mom and what she, what she just knows about stuff that's happening with the kids or with situ, you know, different situations. If you don't lean on your wife's intuition, you know, you're sunk. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and of course for me, you know, by the end of the book, I get straight to, you know, my personal hero, Jane Jacobs, whom I knew personally and who said I was, you know, pretty good too. And, you know, we were of, of one mind in many ways. And she was the first person to employ a new kind of science that is more beauty first, the, the science of organic complexity, of organized complexity. So, so part of the balance is at the end of the book, just lay it out. It's three kinds of scientific problem solving. Mm-hmm. And we've got to know what all three are about. So. You, talk, you talk about soul healing uh, in this book. And that's another part I found um, attractive. There's a book I, w- I, I am reading called uh, Orthodox Psychotherapy. And it's, it's talks, it has a very similar theme. And one of the reasons I find it fascinating and, and enlightening, uh, no pun intended, is that's the soul is something that people don't talk about very often and you hear it it's almost in, in popular vernacular you hear soul music and that girl's got soul and things like that but mm-hmm. i don't think a lot of people uh stop and think what is the soul um and i guess i'd like to ask you can you explain um what the soul is and if you want to even delve into the the different parts of it if, if you'd like to if not that's fine as well yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know yeah. that stuff. Okay, what is the soul? Yeah. Um, well, I, th- I think we should start with a bodily definition of the soul. That okay. in, in the church fathers, or in, at least from Maximus the Confessor onward, that the soul is, first of all, the, the, the life force of the body. In other words, the reason St. Maximus the Confessor will argue that the soul and the body, you know, are formed at the same time. It just it says, well, from the moment of conception, you're alive, and therefore, you have a soul. He he seems to be saying that the soul, you know, uh, first of all, is, is kind of the principle of, of life, of animation in a living thing. So, in the, in the medieval time, they would talk about you know animal souls and things like that. You know, we mm-hmm. have a soul that does not pre-exist the body. That's the Christian view. That's not, say, the Gnostic or the Mormon view, but that's certainly always been the Christian view. And that um, it comes into being together with the body, but it is, to a limited extent, detachable from the body at, at death, for example, but not forever. We, we believe in a bodily resurrection. There, it's going to go back together. Um, so, so the soul is also kind of... Um, you know, somehow centered like the body in the heart or the, the way the, um, some inner disposition of your character, your, it's, it's connected to the emotions as well. It's, um, you know, the, the, your virtues, all these things are bound up with the soul, but, but something that is, is created, so in that sense, it's a part of the material universe, but it's not material in the same way. The soul delights in things like education and 
beauty, beauty and virtue and things that aren't strictly speaking material mm-hmm. goods, mm-hmm. culture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I really can't answer it that well, but well, that, that was a hard part of it. Yeah, that's go. I can promise you that's a better answer than most can give because, um, again, I just think it's something that a lot of people will hear and you'll even kind of repeat in sentences and never stop to think, wait, what is that? Um, the, the, the soul is what, is what hurts when you betray your friend, okay. when you betray someone. And what, what we're finding now, even in secular science, there's something called moral injury, secular psychotherapy, yeah. moral injury. When we have to kill in war, it's the lesser of two evils to kill that enemy. Your soul hurts or your soul is affected. And um, for most people. And so that's another clue to, you know, when the soul feels good or feels really bad, we're more aware of its presence. Yeah, well, that, that's a good jumping off point right there to to the trauma of war. And it's sometimes, uh, unfortunately, uh, soldiers are familiar with because, like I said, that we've a lot of people know nothing except war for the last 20 or so years. Uh, let's talk about uh, basically your take, your approach with this beauty first uh, way of looking at things and, and how that, how can we help the trauma that soldiers go through and the trauma of war and how this can help that as opposed to some of the more conventional therapeutic uh, methods that are familiar. Well, you know, I'm speaking as a, as an Orthodox Christian theologian, <clears throat> a Greek Orthodox Christian theologian. And, um, you, you know, so we understand the idea of just war and the, the checklists, you know, there's important and valuable and beautiful work in those checklists for just war. The only thing we would add is that even if you're participating in a just war, you may experience this moral injury. You may experience this feeling of, of soul grief, you know, at having participated in that war, things either you've seen or things you've done. And so, so just the fact that a war is, is just doesn't mean that it doesn't, you, you don't leave it, injured, morally injured. And um, in terms of how to heal that, I think that, um, I, I mean, I have a general beef with, I don't know about contemporary psychotherapy, but certainly the psychotherapy from Freud through the reform of, of health insurance laws. <laughs> <laughs> because what happened is, I don't know, in the past 20 years or so, 15 years, Health insurance, you know, coverage was reformed. You couldn't, in the old days, your coverage might cover you for a couple of years of therapy. Now you're lucky if you get 10 visits out of them, five visits. Hmm. So that has changed the way psychotherapy is done. There's much more pressure or incentive, however you want to look at it, on therapists to um, give you effective coping techniques within those limited number of sessions, as opposed to say, the therapy that I grew up with in the 80s, which was much more, hey, we can sit here forever and just keep talking. And, and that kind of therapy to me s- seemed to be very, what I call, it was too Greek. It was too Socratic. It was too, the idea that with intellectual awareness would come soul health. And I try to I try to contrast what I call that Greek view with the view of St. Paul, that the very good that I know I should do, I still don't do. That somehow the intellectual is is not of itself sufficient. Some other thing has to happen. I have to be able to go someplace for forgiveness, or I have to have an encounter with redemptive beauty, redemptive holiness. I have to learn some new... um, uh, strategies um, for dealing with the world that merely intellectual insight does not in and of itself heal. In fact, and I get this from personal experience, but also from my great fellow Bostonian, I've never met him, but Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. And he's very negative about this. He says that the talking about traumatic experience, the analysis of it, it's can actually 
you know, make the traumatic response mm-hmm. worse. That was a long answer. So no. I hope that there was some thread in there for the Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. That was a good answer. I'm so happy to have Fox & Sons Coffee as a sponsor of this show for a few reasons. One, Stephen, the owner of this company, has been a proud supporter of the show for quite some time. So two, I get to help him sell his product. And then three, this is selfish, but I also get to drink it every morning. And I really, really like it. So I'm proud to sell this product. Here's his story. And these are his words. I don't even want to translate them through how I would say this because this is so wonderfully put. When I was growing up, I would often go to work with my dad on Saturdays. Those were special father and son days. We would go out for breakfast and he would let me have a cup of coffee. These memories of sharing breakfast and a cup of coffee with my amazing father will always be my favorite memories of him. He has been the best influence in my life and I am forever grateful for those days. I believe this is where my lifelong love for coffee began and that's why I have created Fox & Sons Coffee LLC. Here are his goals, ladies and gentlemen. He wants to share his appreciation for absolutely awesome coffee and he knows you'll agree once you try it. I should say, I know you will agree too, because it is awesome. He wants to honor his father and pass on a business and the spirit of entrepreneurship to his two sons. How about that? Please tell your friends and family about this coffee. It's Fox and Sons Coffee. The website is foxinsons.com. That's F-O-X, the letter N, S-O-N-S.com. Now check this out. You guys know I'm running for city council here in Lockhart, Texas. You also know the Mises Mayor's Pact is a PAC fund that is, well, helping me fund certain parts of this campaign. Can we say that? Is that legal? But you know what I'm talking about. I will tell you this. Steven, the owner of Fox & Sons, is such a proud supporter of this show. He's going to donate $1 per each order that he sells of Fox & Sons coffee to the Mises Mayor's Pact who then in turn, well, helps me out, helps me out in my run for city council in Lockhart, Texas. So you get delicious coffee, you're helping out a great supporter of this show, and then you're helping me run for city council. How fun is that? And I'm going to need more coffee, I have a feeling. So keep the Fox and Sons coffee coming. Once again, that's foxandsons.com. Let's get back to the show. You know, maybe this, I hope this isn't kind of a narrow way of looking at things, but it seems with all of the war that people have seen, like I mentioned, the last several decades, even the last few years, there's been, it seems or feels like more trauma than I was used to seeing and hearing about 10 years ago, maybe. But um, people being locked down, they couldn't go anywhere. You hear, you would hear about old people almost kind of dying of broken hearts and loneliness and things like that over the last few years. Um, there was, of course, at this point, we understand that the media kind of likes uh, fear baiting and, and click baiting over fear tactics and things like that. Did those things over the past few years, do you think that uh, basically caused more trauma in our society than we were used to seeing? I, I, I mean, first of all, I want to I want to distinguish between sort of tra- what we might call traumatic events, like okay. bad, the really bad things that happen, whether they happen slow or sudden. You know, um, from a person who's been traumatized and who has now um, a- a- adopted unconsciously a new way of being that is. Um, oriented all for defense. There's a, a kind of shutting down the person who's been traumatized. So I think people are much more likely to describe bad events as traumatic events. And, but that's related, but still quite distinct from actually a person who has, has been traumatized and, you know, and that's usually corresponds to not only bad things, but some sense that the moral order has been violated or has been revealed as lacking. So it's ugly things combined with bad things. So so it's Hmm. okay. So, so on, on the positive side, on the positive side of soul healing, the, the sequence I counsel is beauty, goodness, truth. Trauma is this ugliness concealing a moral bad. And that the, and, and, 
leading to the conclusion that actual beauty and goodness are a lie. So it's like beauty, so it's like ugliness, badness, the lie. So um, I think people use the language of trauma more. I don't know if more people are traumatized. Okay. Um, certainly, um, maybe in some ways we have less resilience, maybe in some ways we have more. So I, I don't really, I don't really know. Um, But I, I do, I did want to say this because you mentioned old people and that touched my heart. We may be critical of someone who in the face of bad events develops an actual traumatized response. But if the event is sufficiently ugly and bad, for most people, maybe everyone, there's two choices, being traumatized or just dying. <clears throat> and, and that's why you see so many old people who have wisdom, who have seen God in their lives, who've lived beautiful lives. When their spouse of many decades dies, then within some short mm -hmm. period of time, a, a month to a year, they just die. So the traumatic response, the tr the being a traumatized is a survival mechanism but it's not a survival mechanism with really good op uh, alternatives. Right. It, it's, and and, and the, 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 there is a kind of secret or a, you know, a less publicized you know, orthodox teaching about the Virgin Mary, and we you know, call the mother of God, that at the cross, she saw her, her only son and her God tortured, stripped naked, brutalized, and murdered. That she would have just simply died. She would never have developed a traumatic, a traumatized response because, because the, the, the purity of her soul was such that that was not an option. But she, she would simply have died. And a, a recent saint um, who died in 1938, Saint Silouan, the Athenite Saint Silouan, he said, he, said, he said she would have simply died, but her son gave her an extra grace he wanted her to, to live to see his resurrection. So, so, um, so I said trauma is a kick in the head. Sometimes life is, is just too much. And, and so, so, you know, if someone listening to this has been traumatized or something, you know, they will feel that they're weak. Maybe that they somehow failed, but you didn't really have a lot of options there. Yeah, this is this is going to be switching gears a bit, but um, it, you do that within this book, and I I appreciate it. Oh yeah, switch away. I don't, it gives you it gives you a chance to take a break. The gender wars. Um, there's some there's some stuff. If if, if people read in certain circles, it would certainly bristle or uh, ruffle some feathers in 2022. Only males at the holy altar. And we can get into that, this section. How, how did the gender wars begin? Well, I mean, we, we have this idea in the, the, you know, one of the greatest church fathers, St. Maximus the Confessor, that Christ came to heal five great divisions. And I list them in the book, and I couldn't tell you what they are, right? <laughs> I know some of them, but I don't make a point of trying to memorize. But the first one is, the gender division, this kind of war between male and female. Um, you know, how he thought about that gender war was probably not, you know, the way I, as a former consumer of Oprah, you know, think about it. <laughs> but it, it's certainly in something analogous to there that we have, you know, the, that, you know, as Seneca said, you know, Roman men cannot understand their wives. The, the, we, we are different. Our brains are organized differently um, because of um, hormonal impacts on the brain while we're still in the womb. And so we see the world in different ways. And I think, I think, um, I think women are the great apostles of the beauty first way, mm -hmm. which really is, is, is the more, in some sense, you know, the more important way. But men are the custodians of these, of, the, of perhaps the other two ways and a, a truth first or a goodness first approach, which are kind of necessary specialties. They're necessary subspecialties. 
And, um, you know, men have utility. We, <laughs> we, we are, um, well, we're serial, we're more likely to be serial killers and we're more likely to be geniuses. Mm -hmm. And the, the male brain is somehow a weaponized version of the female brain. And, um, that weaponization, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a truth first era was thought to be, you know, an unalloyed good thing and it made us superior. But in reality, it's a, it's a disability as well. And it's a disability that renders us, well, it, it gives us a much shorter lifespan and it just, it renders us mm -hmm. dependent on women in good ways because um, they do not share that particular, in a sense, look, anything that is one thing is not everything else. So in a sense, anything you are is a disability, right? I mean, a killer whale is no use when it comes time to plow the back 40, you know, it, it, it can't get out of the water. It's, it's not, so, so anything is a disability, but specifically the basic template of the human being in the, in the womb is female. And then at some point in the endocrinology unleashes whatever and the male brain takes it a different shape and it gives it certain powers and gives it certain blind spots. And that just is what it is. I mean, I, I mean, ultimately what will happen, I mean, you, you look at this in female, in, in, uh, in transgender sports, right? Mm. It's okay now for a man to claim to be a woman and compete in women's sports if he also takes hormone blockers. Right. So everyone is admitting there is a biological difference. So, so, but it's true in the brain as well. Now, a, a more classy era, you know, can look at that difference as the grounds of a genuine unity and also as the source of an enormous amount of humor. But in a fallen world, it's also the source of conflict and, and there's something tragic, you know, about. Even, even cultural difference is, is, is tragic, right? In the sense that I can't fully be all cultures and understand every culture out there. I can only be the two or three or, I don't know if there's, the limit is, cultures that are available, you know, to my youthful experience. And so, so d difference of any kind has a tragic, and, and, and then, and then, and then all. Wicked, out of, for wicked reasons, people try to exploit those differences, don't they? Mm. So, you know. And there's lots, uh, you know, certainly probably not where you're uh, employed, but there's lots of educational institutions that will say, or at least preaching, that there are no differences in this manner. Well, I, I think that, you know, we, we want to... Well, it, it depends. You know, the further you get away from nature, the deeper you get into the city, uh, the more you can, you know, play games like that. You can mm. play transgender games. You can play same-sex attraction games. You can sustain all kinds of things that when you strip away civilization, just don't stand. Like, it's just much harder, you know, um, it's just it's just much harder to do that. But civilization opens up possibilities. Now, the, the question is, which of those possibilities do we believe, do I believe as a Christian, we want to pursue? And which ones do we want to hang a, a do not disturb sign on them? <laughs> you know, so um, I thought that Rudy Giuliani, you know, was made a mistake to appear in drag on Saturday Night Live. But certainly that is a possibility within cities and it's humorous and it has what it is. Um, but, um, but maybe for someone else, a comedian, that's not a mistake. In fact, it's a blessing to us to see them in a, in a play, you know, adopt the persona of the other gender. So, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a conservative per se, right? But um, neither am I a progressive. <laughs> I'm just a guy 
trying to follow Christ and, 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 and asking, you know, for clarity to, you know, to find my way in this world. But yes, cities make all kinds of things possible that aren't. And we have to decide which of those things are good for us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's an interesting take. I appreciate this. Um, if but like with people, food, we, 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 can, we can eat anything in any season because of cities. Mm -hmm. But lots of people have concluded this is not a great idea. We can grow food hydroponically with no soil. But lots of people yeah. think this is a big mistake. <laughs> we've got to, we've, I'm a big apostle of the regenerative ranching, regenerative agriculture mm -hmm. movement. And I, I think organic agriculture is just a total waste of time. You've got to take that next step to regenerative. Um, and I mean, that's talk about nature. <laughs> you just can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. Do we, do we want to, do you want to upload your persona into a computer and mm -hmm. live forever? I don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, but cities make that possible. Eventually they will. Yeah. If there's people listening who have suffered trauma, like we can say specifically war trauma and are interested in stuff that, that we've discussed in this, what advice would you have for them, if, if any, if, and just basically trying to uh, direct them in the right place toward the right direction for, for healing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Now, what, what, what do you do? That's a fantastic question. You know, I think, um, you know, in, in chapter, I think it's chapter four of the book, you know, I'm, I'm a little negative about therapy, this, this therapy that I think of as too Greek. And mm -hmm. as I said, I'm following in the footsteps of two people there. Um, well, I said one, Bessel van der Kolk, and then a, a third Bostonian, Jonathan Shea, who wrote Achilles in Vietnam. They're the ones who said, and they're therapists, one's a psychiatrist, one's a, a therapist, saying, you know, certain ways in which we've approached the soul have been counterproductive, in particular in the case of trauma. Trauma is, uh, it is a, a limit. It's the limit condition. Um, it's a kind of, it's another definition that we use in the book. It's a kind of excommunication um, that is so total that we ourselves are now, have been, um, our energies, our powers, our natural reactions have been enlisted in the further excommunication of our own self, even from ourself. And it's a dangerous condition. We know we don't want to live our lives there. Um, I, I, so in the book, I'm a little negative on therapy, but I will say this. Um, certainly I'm guided by two therapists, Jonathan Shea and Bessel van der Kolk in, in a lot of, you know, what I, and then of course my own experience. Handsome is as handsome does. If talking about it makes it better, then keep talking about it. If a Greek approach, you know, this Socratic approach works, go ahead. You know, if it's, if a, a, um, a more moralistic approach is working, then by all means, go ahead. Um, but if you find that those approaches cease working or work to a point and then start to, you know, circle back and become, you know, diminishing return, then, you know, I would look to other things. I would look to, um, you know, maybe a spiritual father in the church that, or a spiritual mother that seems to have that all surpassing mildness in which your traumatic defensiveness can begin to soften imperceptibly, replaced not by the terror of vulnerability, but but some, some other kind of strength, you know, uh, a, a, a boundary that's softer but stronger than the old brittle boundary that we had. So the church, I think there's a lot to be said for using different senses. Like I like these equine therapies because I imagine the person mm. getting the smell of that horse. I imagine them petting that horse, I mean, as they groom it. Um, and I like church because of the olfactory I like incense, you know, the right kind of incense is something, you know, they say that, that in evolutionary time, that sense of smell is one of the older senses, you know, because it has to do with chemical sensing, you know, even in 
I don't know, even on the you, you know, protozoa or something, you know, in the ocean or something, right? It's, so I, I don't trust therapies that don't activate the sense of smell. <laughs> so, 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 um, but in general, I think, you know, that there is some encounter with theophany, with beauty that begins to supplant in our memories and in our experience that one moment or several years of terror that we experienced in the traumatizing thing. And, you know, there's, there's that Robin Williams movie where he plays a, a, a mentally ill person in New York City. He's a homeless guy, the Fisher King. And, um, and, and he, 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 he had a psychotic break because of uh, a, a traumatic event. He saw his wife murdered in front of his eyes, his beloved wife. Um, and when he becomes healthy again at the end, um, he says something so mild about his wife. You know, there was this woman and I loved her. You know, I mean, it was, it was just something, there's some kind of... Um, In, in the book, you know, we talk about trauma and, and Jonathan Shea trauma in terms of Aristotle. Aristotle mm -hmm. saying, gods and beasts live outside the city, but men, human beings need the city. And, and what frightens me or what um, lets me know that trauma reactions are not your destiny is they trauma, trauma, the reaction of the traumatized person renders us simultaneously a god maybe an avenging God and, and an animal, like a beast. And we feel that in a traumatic reaction, that coinciding of God and animal. And that's just no way to live. So, so we need those experiences which bring us back into our own skin. Still, having said all this, it's not like, I mean, I feel like I, there ought to be like a toll-free number, but I don't know what's, what's out there. You know, I'm an ethicist. I'm a theologian. I'm a dean of a small college uh, <laughs> trying to like ask, you know, why is this kid not doing well in school? And, um, and I'm not really up on all the, the latest rich uh, literature uh, at this point, especially people reading my book are saying that I've hit on something and that, and I know, I, I know I have, I just, I know it's, it just, it's, it's, the book is beautiful and it's, um, and it rings true, you know? So, but it's just really, there's got to be other people out there thinking about these things who know better than I do. I, I think Bessel van der Kolk has a, has, he has a center here in Boston. I, I mean, I can't vouch for it, but his some I think it's in Brookline, actually, right here. So. Well, speaking of that book, now's the time you get to plug anything you'd like. The book, um, the, I think, movie production, any, any, really anything, you, anything yeah. you'd like. I want to plug it all. Um, yeah, the, 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 um, the book is available from stnicholaspress.net. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it is, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a good investment, you know, because, you know, it, it, it's a total vision of society. And then the final chapter of economics, urban planning, science itself through the beauty first way. It's really what we're ready for now. We are ready to... Um, you know, we, we, <clears throat> we're ready to repair our society, our, our world in a more holistic way. And I think if you're a Christian, I think this is a good book, whether or not you're Orthodox would matter. Um, I think this is a good, you know, important step. Um, and, and, in, and then we do get to the achievements of Jane Jacobs. I mean, she was a seminal apocryphal person and, I, and she does not really get the credit that she deserves, <clears throat> people notice this or that, but I have a much more holistic vision of her accomplishment. So I would plug the book. I would also, um, I do have this side, the sideline of uh, Beauty First Films. Um, a friend of mine and I founded that film company and we've got two films in post and you can go to beautyfirstfilms.com if you wanna see what we're up to. We actually created a calendar um, that tries to balance the masculine and the feminine in, in, in time. Because our calendar is this, you know, it's this Roman 
fixing, freezing of old lunar calendars into a strictly solar calendar. But the calendar of the church is a, is a, is a dialogue between so, so, uh, lunar and solar time. And so our calendar shows each page is a different liturgical season instead of months. Um, nice. And, and then <clears throat> Hellenic College itself is, is a good place to send your kids or to come if you haven't finished college because it's, um, it's, a, it's a really a beauty-first kind of approach to education here. Everything, um, well, we're just all sinners. I mean, what, what, am, I, what am I trying to, <laughs> try to like, deceive anyone? But it's a, it's a very, um, there's a mildness and a, um, a grace that permeates the teaching experience here. And we have a, a beautiful chapel, which is almost entirely student-run. You know, we... we <clears throat> It's not, it's not an official policy. It, it should be. Um, that uh, the chapel is a place where the students can be with God <laughs> without us. Because I was a student here a long time ago. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the moment a professor walks in, you're like, oh, am I dressed right? And was mm-hmm. I late? And, but for the most part, it's just the students, you know, dozens of them in there chanting. There's one priest up there, of course doing the chanting, the serving, um, keeping everything clean and order, orderly and the candle box tended mm. and all that. And that's, that's a good, that's a good thing. You know, it's a, I think it's a, it's a place where kids can mature on this campus. I mean, um, uh, in a, in a very mild, a, a very gentle and fast way, I think. Um, Excellent. Yeah, those are some good plugs. What, what, those what are some else? good ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, do, do you have a, a Twitter handle at all? I, I, I have two of them. Um, one of them is, I don't remember what it's called, and the other one, I don't remember what that's called either. <laughs> I stopped using t- Twitter because, I have to say, you know, full disclosure, I find it addictive to the point that it could kill me. Oh. Look, I, I, have, I have spent many a night um, at 3 a.m., with one eye open, one thumb, and I cannot stop scrolling Twitter. And, and it, it, it completely hijacks my brain. So I'm totally off Twitter. And I, I'm not saying it's bad for other people. Sure. I loved Twitter. It was hilarious. <laughs> and there's no faster way to dip into another subculture and find out what they're talking about to each other. Yeah. It, it's, it's a fantastic thing. But for me, it's my heroine. I cannot do it. Wow. I just can't do okay. it. Facebook is hard enough for me. Uh-huh. And, you know, I mean, those things were designed yeah. by people who wanted to make them addictive. Yeah. And they studied the science of brain addiction and they put those things in there. So, plus, now that they, they you know, Facebook and Twitter, now that they're, like, they're censoring everyone, I yeah. mean, <laughs> that's so ridiculous. Yeah. You know, you, you got to have some faith that the truth will out. And and mm-hmm. and have some uh, faith in the in the marketplace of ideas and all that, and it's just so so. I still do a little bit of Instagram, and I you know, I'll, I, but probably every couple of weeks I'll just shred who I'm following down to like you know the ten people I know personally. You know, it just it just seems to get, it gets too much. So uh, those things are rough for me. I I, I think yeah. Well, this has been good. Uh, no Twitter handle, you guys. No Twitter. And if any of my listeners are out there doing stuff like at 3 a.m., uh, looking with one eye open on, and one thumb on the, on the light. can't stop. Uh, I'm praying yeah, for you. Yeah, put Twitter away. You guys, come on. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Timothy, it's us. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I got, I'm glad we got to end but on. Most people aren't that addicted to Twitter. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's a... Uh, just like some people can't handle alcohol and some can't. I mean, yes. I have no interest in alcohol. I drink a little bit. I couldn't care less. But, yeah. you know, I can't do Twitter. That's all I'm saying. I'm not Got trying it. to diss the media. <laughs> yeah, no worries at all. Thanks so much for being here on Counterflow. Thank you, sir. Buck, thank you for having me. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and God bless anyone who's suffering. Trauma is a, is a, is a thing. It's no joke. And, uh, you know, uh, God bless everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys once again for being with me here this week on the Counterflow Podcast. Back at it. Next week, I've got an interview lined up and we are going live again, if you will. Not really live, but you know what I mean. I was grateful again to Dr. Timothy Patitsis for doing this. 
Hope you guys enjoyed it. As for this show, like I always tell you, counterflowpodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. We've got the Telegram group. Oh, and this one will be on YouTube. Subscribe to our page on YouTube. The views are starting to go up. I just disregarded my YouTube page for so long, but now it's going strong. So thank you guys for subscribing on there. I hope you're enjoying that version. You get to see us if you like doing it that way. And until next week, have a good one. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.